Hello everyone, I'm Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. Welcome to this series on behavioral health for your snakes. This episode is going to be an introduction and so I want to give you some background and most of this information is from Mater's Reptile and Amphibian Medicine and Surgery, the third edition, which came out in 2019. Snakes and other reptiles have evolved to hide illness or injury as a survival mechanism to avoid predation. That only makes sense. If you're a wild snake, you don't want other animals that might want to eat you to know that you're inhibited, that something's wrong with you, that you might be weak, because then it would make you more attractive to come after. As a consequence of that, behavioral signs of illness or injury from your snake or other reptile might be subtle. That's because they're trying to hide the fact that they are injured or ill. Lack of normal behavior may be an indicator that there's a health or psychological wellness issue. Snakes and other reptiles have a comparatively slow metabolism and slower physiologic responses than mammals, which can mean disease and illness may develop more slowly. By the time behavioral indicators and changes are obvious, the disease or illness may have been present for a long time and progress to a severe stage when you finally notice it. Now note from here on out, I'm just gonna say snakes, but I also mean other reptiles as well. When one snake is kept as a pet without conspecifics or others of its kind, it can be difficult for us to know what's normal and what isn't because there aren't other snakes for us to compare it to. Caretakers need to have a really good grasp of what is normal behavior for the species they're caring for and be able to recognize subtle reptile body language, which is even less pronounced in snakes. Abnormal behavior can be a consequence of captivity. So recognizing what is normal for the snake under captive management is crucial to recognizing when behavior is not normal. It's important to be able to discriminate between behavior due to captive environments due to stress or as a result of illness, injury, or disease. Let's talk about developing a baseline so that you can determine when something is wrong with your snake or may be wrong with your snake. You want to establish husbandry protocols based on the natural history and biology of the species in your care. Provide an environment where the snake has opportunities to express their full repertoire of natural behaviors, or as many as is possible for you to allow. Provide opportunities to encounter novelty and express new behaviors that may be captivity-based. By giving the snake choices, offering as many options as possible, and interfering as little as possible, you can observe and establish a catalog of normal captive behaviors for your animal. You want to do this over a long enough period of time that you can establish what's normal once the snake is used to their living situation and also based on seasons, reproductive cycles, just changes that the snake may go through throughout the year. I recommend watching your animal and establishing this baseline over about one year at a minimum. And this is going to ultimately allow you to notice when something is not normal. Well, how do you track behavior? It can be very formal or very informal, and it can be a study of one, meaning you're just tracking the behavior of one animal, or you can track the behavior of a group of animals. You can use surveillance cameras, personal observation. You can use an ethogram. You can just use a diary or journal and, and just make handwritten notes. It's whatever's easiest for you, and I'm gonna show you some examples with one of my snakes in particular that I have done a study of one with, and then I'm going to show you just a sample ethogram in case you're studying a whole group. I watched my Morelia Bradley Ronan for actually two years, and we're well over two years now, but I tracked him specifically for 365 days, and I was looking for a very specific focal behavior of how much time he spent out of his enclosure versus in his enclosure when given the choice and control to do that basically whenever he wanted. And this is just a simple chart that I made up could make something that looks like this. It's just got the days or the repetitions, the, t the number of times that you've made observations, the date of the observation. My two observations here 
the green um, X on the left indicates the nights that he chose to come out, and this red X on the right indicates the nights that he chose not to come out. And then I had a place for notes on the right-hand side here. And then also on his chart, I just kept track of his weight history, his shed history, and his veterinary history. I kept track of his meals in the notes section, but he also has a meal card on his enclosure. This is what I determined after observing him for one year. His enclosure was open nightly at sunset, unless he woke up sooner, and then it was opened for him when he woke up. He was placed back in his enclosure between 4 a.m. and 6 a.m., or just before dawn. And so given the opportunity with complete choice and control to come and go as he pleased nightly, basically when he was awake and active, Ronan stayed in his enclosure, chose not to come out for 45 nights, and he chose to come out 320 nights, which averaged 88% of his awake time was out of his enclosure. So the question I have here on the slide is what future behavior might indicate a wellness issue. And for this particular snake, who spends 88% of his awake time out of his enclosure, I would say that if suddenly he stopped coming out, that that might indicate a wellness issue, that something has changed with him, his health perhaps, or his mental state, and we need to investigate that because it would be highly unusual for a snake that for two years, but one year being specifically tracked, spends 88% of his time out of his enclosure when he's awake. If he suddenly stopped doing that, it could indicate an issue for sure. And that's the type of thing you're looking for, and it's why you want to keep some behavior records on your snake. This is just an example of an ethogram if you're watching a group of animals. This enables you to put the date you're observing the animals and the animal's names on a piece of paper and just go through at different time intervals and mark what behavior the animal is doing when. You can literally just put a check mark in a box at these specific times. This is just the rest of that piece of paper. So you also want to know what interval you're using. So maybe you walk through and you look at your 10 snakes every 30 minutes for 12 hours or every hour for 12 hours. You can choose your interval and you just mark what they're doing at that time when you see them. It's called scan sampling and it's just going to give you a big picture idea of how the snakes are spending their time. If you're going to do a formal or semi-formal ethogram chart like the one I just showed you, and if you think anyone else might look at that and need to know what all of your focal behaviors mean, I recommend that you define each one. For example, on this ethogram, if I mark that the snake is on the ground, you look here at number five, it says majority of body on the ground, on, under, or touching substrate, ground level of enclosure. And that would be in contrast to if I marked arboreal number four, which means the majority of the body is not touching the ground, is off the ground, maybe on perches, ledges, shells, in vegetation, or on top of the enclosure furnishings. You just want to define any behavior that you're just putting a check mark next to on your list. This is an example of the other half of my list where I have even more behaviors defined. So for example, number 10, locomotion, I've got defined as movement, actively moving around the enclosure or from one location to another. Define any behaviors that you're gonna have in your list and your list of behaviors is going to be logical for whatever species you're observing. In conclusion, snakes under captive management are subject to captivity stress. They are dependent on their keepers for resources and for access to opportunities to express natural behaviors. When snakes are motivated to do a behavior that they're not able to do because of their environment, physical and behavioral health can be impacted. Confinement, restraint, and handling are all inherently stressful to snakes. This is where we're gonna pick up in part two where we're gonna talk about stress from physical handling and from enclosure disturbance. These are the resources that I used in this presentation and that I will primarily be using in the rest of this series about behavioral health and wellness. If you have any questions from me, please contact me at my website, behavioreducation.org, email me at behavioreducationllc at gmail.com or reach me on social media. 
Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Thank you for learning with me today. And until next time, everybody, please remember to always be kind and love your animals.